Take our Bibles tonight, uh, that precious book that we, sometimes we take for granted. Let's go to the book of Philemon if we can, uh, the book of Philemon. And um, we, again, are just uh, in the habit. We're just so used to having a Bible, we don't sometimes even think about it. But then we're reminded of places in which uh, the Bible is not as readily available as we heard from just a moment ago. Uh, we're in the book of Philemon. Of course, we have uh, begun here on Wednesday nights. It'll carry us, Lord willing, through the end of August before we break back up into the various adult Bible fellowships, studying the book of Philemon. And, of course, Philemon is a letter that is written from the Apostle Paul to this man by the name of Philemon. The book, of course, bears his name. And it is the smallest of the Apostle Paul's writings. In fact, as we began a few weeks ago, we said that there are certain chapters of Paul's writings, almost certain sentences in Paul's writings that would be about the same length as the entire book of Philemon. And so it is a brief letter, it's a brief book, uh, but there's a lot of great, great things that are found in, in this particular letter. And I want us to focus in tonight, beginning in verse number 10, uh, reading down through verse uh, number, uh, number 13. Uh, and we'll again find our, our text really and our main thoughts from these particular verses tonight, where Paul writes, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was... To thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. If you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I would encourage you maybe just to highlight or maybe underline or maybe draw a circle around one word found in verse number 10. Can we go back to that verse number 10 on the screen if we can so we can all see it together? And that word there is begotten, begotten. Paul uses this word to describe what took place upon Onesimus' conversion. Um, the word, of course, is this word begotten, and it really is a beautiful word because it denotes or conveys the idea or the concept of family. The word literally means, it literally means to procreate. When a man has a son or a daughter that is born to him, uh, he has begotten that child. Um, that child from that point on will bear his last name, will, will bear his image and likeness. That child will live in his home. Uh, that child will become his responsibility for the duration of his formative years. Um, and, and all of these things happen upon the conception and birth of a child that is begotten to a, to a set of parents. I, I tell you that in our culture, uh, more often than not, there is great rejoicing when a child has been begotten. Oftentimes, gifts are given and kind words offering congratulations are offered when a, uh, when a man uh, be, begets a child, when a woman welcomes a, a baby into this world. And I have to tell you that all of the above... Things like, again, the uh, relationship side of things and the, uh, the attachment to mom and dad and the celebration, all of that is true. We know that to be true in the physical manifestation of a child being begotten. But I must tell you that there are many spiritual connections that we could make as well. When we start to think about a, uh, the, the, the begetting of a child, we understand that when a soul is begotten by God, certain things take place. I would say, first of all, that God's begotten bear his name. God's begotten bear his name. The name, of course, that we often go by is Christian. And, of course, that name is directly connected with Jesus' official title, which is Christ. Christ, Christian, little Christ, we're, to, uh, we're to, to, to bear his name in the way that we live, in the way that we conduct ourselves. The name or the title Christ, it means Messiah. It means deliverer, anointed one, or Savior. And so God's begotten bear his name. Just like those of you that have children in this room tonight, uh, they bear your name. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a daughter, she'll grow up and she'll take on someone else's name. But at this point in time, her name is your name. And uh, if you've begotten a son, that boy will carry your name throughout uh, the remainder of his life. And just as that's true in the physical, so it is also true in the spiritual that we bear God's name as his begotten. But notice there's a second thought when we're again making the connection between the physical and the spiritual, and that is this, that God's begotten will inhabit his home 
for all of eternity. You know, when a set of parents welcome a new child, they're there in the hospital for a day or two. But the day comes, the moment comes in which that child is discharged, that mom is discharged from the hospital, and it's time for those people to go home. You can't stay here any longer. And of course, the idea is, is that mom and dad, ideally mom and dad, load the little baby up, tiny little thing up into one of those uh, baby car seat car carrier things and load that child into the car and they set their uh, GPS or they set their car in the direction of home and they take that child home to live with them. Kind of strange, wouldn't it, if somebody had a baby and, uh, and uh, you know, they said, you know, I don't know that we really want to have this baby in our house. Let's drop him off with, you know, mom and, you know, mom and dad's house, or let's put him here. Let's put him there. You, that, that wouldn't make any sense. That wouldn't be the right way to go about things. No, that child that has been begotten uh, has an opportunity, has a place in the home of his parents. So you and I are promised by our savior, Jesus Christ, that as his followers, there is a place reserved for us in his father's house. We read of that in John chapter number 14. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I get thrilled when I think about the fact that I have a home for all of eternity in the Father's house. Why? Because I'm special? Because, uh, because I've earned it? Because I've worked my way to that position? No, I'm, I have a home there because I'm a child of God. And because I have been begotten by God into his family. But there's also another thought. God's begotten bear, not only his name, but we bear his image and his likeness. You know, just as some children maybe more resemble their parents than others, some believers might more resemble their heavenly father than others. You know, ask yourselves the question tonight, how closely do I resemble my heavenly father? How much do I look like him? Are there areas in which I, uh, I could uh, see dramatic improvement in, uh, in my, my bearing his image and uh, his likeness? Perhaps some of you uh, have, uh, at some point in your life, you've gone to a mirror and you've looked in that mirror. And if you look hard enough and long enough, maybe squint just a little bit, uh, you can almost see uh, your parents in that mirror when you're really just looking at yourself. Or perhaps maybe you could see a grandparent or maybe some other family member, a brother or a sister. Isn't it amazing how that works? Isn't it amazing how we're connected to one another as family, even in the way that we, uh, in the way that we appear, that we bear the image and likeness? Periodically, I'll meet a new family and, and I'll look and say, you, you, you two are brother and sister. How did you know? It's just obvious. You look like one another. You bear, that's your son. Well, how did you know that? Because he looks just like you. And did you know that as believers, as followers of God, we are to bear his image and his likeness? Or to look like him in things like holiness and uh, righteousness and, and love and, and, and peace and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a host of others that we read of there in uh, Galatians chapter number five as we think of the fruit of the Spirit, the things that the Holy Spirit of God produces in the life of a believer. All of those, of course, are tied back to our Heavenly Father. But notice, notice there's another thought, and that is this that God's begotten become his responsibility to grow and develop into maturity. When you have a child, it becomes your responsibility to feed that child and to uh, clothe that child and to give that child a comfortable bed to sleep in and, and, and at some point down the road to make sure that child is getting an adequate education and, and has everything that it needs to succeed. And did you know that when you and I become a child of God, he takes upon himself the responsibility to, uh, to fashion and to mold, to grow us into maturity into what he would have us to be. That becomes his responsibility. He begins to work in our lives, perhaps to, uh, to, to remove some things that ought not to be there, to teach us some things that we ought to know, uh, to grow us in some ways in which we desperately need to see growth. And so understand that the Christian life mirrors the physical life requiring things like food and rest and instruction and strength and growth. And here's what God does. God gives us his word. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us other believers to aid and assist in this. He gives us trials even. He gives us blessings. All of these things 
to help us in our, in our, in our journey to Christian growth and to maturity. And then I notice there's, a, there's a, third, a final thought here, and that is this, that God's begotten produce great rejoicing in heaven upon their new birth. Jesus said as much in Luke 15, verse number 7, in Luke 15 and verse number 10, he said that when one sinner repents of their sin, he said there is great rejoicing, there is great celebration in heaven. Perhaps maybe you've heard recently of the birth of a child. Maybe it was announced on Facebook or perhaps maybe you received a text message and, and maybe in that text message even came a picture of the new baby and, and uh, the, the reaction, what's the response to be to that? Wonderful, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. Uh, he's, so, he's so beautiful, she's so beautiful. What a blessing, what a joy. And we celebrate things like that, don't we? Well, did you know that when God the, God the Father be, begets a child, uh, that child is, is procreate, the child is born into the family of God, the Bible says that that produces much cause for rejoicing in a place the Bible calls heaven. Now, all of this is true, and certainly much more could be said. But let me ask this question tonight. What about when God saves someone who maybe has personally targeted you with an offense or trespassed against you in some way. How do we respond to that? That really, is the, that really is the context, that's the reality under which this letter is being written. Onesimus had previously been the slave of Philemon. He had run away without permission, and he had stolen from Philemon in the process. And it would be hard, it would be really hard, imagining Philemon having any positive thoughts about Onesimus after what? He had done. I mean, every time that, that mental image would come of Onesimus, his former slave, and what he had done, and how he had run away, and how he had uh, taken what it did not belong to him, and, 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 and had fled, and, and really had broken the law. Every time that face would have appeared in Philemon's mind, likely uh, it would have not produced good thoughts. It would not have produced favorable thoughts, but it perhaps produced thoughts of anger and bitterness and and, and, and animosity and, and maybe, even, maybe even twinges of hatred and, and, uh, and, and frustration. Perhaps Philemon was working diligently to guard his heart against bitterness, knowing the damage that bitterness could do in his own life as well as in the lives of others around him. Uh, the question is this, are these realities still true when it comes to the conversion or new birth of someone we don't particularly care for or about. Maybe the person that at a previous time in your life uh, was instrumental in really making your life miserable. And then you hear they get saved. And perhaps maybe we'd say something like this. Well, maybe that'll do them some good. You know, as if, you know, okay, well, I'm sort of celebrating, but I'm, I'm also sort of just saying how I really feel about that person. Well, that's, again, that's the context in which this letter is being written. Paul is writing Philemon to let him know, hey, listen, you know the guy that offended you and hurt you and trespassed against you? He has been begotten. He has been born again. He has been born into the family of God. Now, Paul writes this letter to Philemon to explain the change that had come over Onesimus since his conversion. And he writes it to ask Philemon to now do the Christian thing by receiving Onesimus and restoring him. In other words, what Paul is saying is he's saying, listen, listen, Philemon, the painful choices, the bad decisions that were made by, Phile by Onesimus previously, those things are now under the blood of Jesus. And here's what Paul's asking Philemon to do. He's saying, I want you to forget about those things as well. I want you to bury those things as well, and I want you to receive him, and I want you to restore him. Now, here's the question I want to ask tonight. When, when someone is begotten, what difference does it make in their life? I recently had an opportunity to sit down with a man who visited our church actually on Sunday. I met with him on Monday night in my office, and a fascinating story. Uh, Lord willing, at some time, I'd, I'd like to tell it to you, but... Tonight, for the sake of time, I'll just tell you that he got saved years ago, is my understanding, in a secular university environment. And, um, and I looked at him in my office, and I, as he's sharing his testimony with me, I said, let me ask you this, sir. I said, what difference, what difference has your salvation made in your life? And I could tell that it was a question that maybe he hadn't given a whole lot of thought to. 
He paused for a moment. He was very reflective. And then he began to speak and he began to talk about some of the things that God had done in his life. But I want to kind of turn that around. I want to ask that man tonight. I want to ask you, since you've been saved, since you've been begotten, since you've become a child of God, what difference has that faith, has that new birth, what difference has that made in your life? I think Paul addresses the the difference that the new birth causes in the life of an individual. And I want to share them with you. Number one, I believe he teaches in verse number 11 that the new birth transforms the unprofitable into profitable. The new birth takes someone who at one point was unprofitable and transforms them so that now they are profitable. Onesimus had been an unprofitable slave prior to his conversion. He had stolen from Philemon. He had run away from his master in search of a new life. And I just have to tell you, he had found a new life, hadn't he? (laughs) But it probably wasn't the life that he was pursuing. As he ran to Rome and he's trying probably to blend in and maybe perhaps he's wanting to sow some wild oats and, and maybe just live a little and experience some things that maybe he could not have experienced as a slave. It was at that point in which he met the Apostle Paul. And I have to tell you, he discovered a new life, but it certainly wasn't the life that he probably set out to discover. But it was new life nonetheless. New life in Christ. And that new life in Christ transformed Onesimus into a profitable man who had previously been an unprofitable person. And here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying to Philemon, he's saying, listen, I promise you that if you take Onesimus back, you will be getting someone brand new. You are going to be getting... I know know what you think, and I know what you remember. I know what your experiences were before. I get all of that. I understand all of that. But that was before he met Jesus Christ. That was before he had been begotten. He had not yet experienced the new birth. And and as a result of him experiencing the new birth, I'm, I'm telling you, Philemon, take my word for it. You can trust me here. You're getting a new and, and, and a better and improved Onesimus. Now think about, think about this and, and, and think about what ways that he had been unprofitable before, but now he could be profitable. Well, I would say, first of all, in the area of trustworthiness. You see, previously, as it relates to being someone that could be trusted, Onesimus was unprofitable. He couldn't be trusted. We, we never know what his next move is going to be. He's, he's shifty. He's flighty. He, he can't be trusted. See, he's got a, he's got a far away look in his eye. He's, he's looking to bolt. He's looking to take advantage of the situation. He's looking to do us wrong. But you know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying by the fact that he is profitable, he is saying, listen, I, I know what you remember. I know, I, I know how he, how he ran away. I know how he was someone you couldn't, couldn't trust. But now I promise you as a, As a believer, he's someone that you can put your trust in. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in Ephesians 4.28. I think they might appear on the screen. And they say this, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now the context of Ephesians chapter number 4 is the idea of putting off the old man and putting on the new man which is created after God in righteousness and in true holiness. And the Apostle Paul lists several things that a new man ought to be. And he lists several things that a new man ought to put off. Things that no longer match or no longer fit the new man who's created after God in righteousness and true holiness. And one of those things is this idea of stealing, of taking that which does not belong to him. And Paul writes that a new man in Christ should put away stealing. When Onesimus met Christ, he was transformed from an unprofitable, untrustworthy servant who had no problem stealing and taking that which not, did not belong to him to now becoming a profitable servant. Uh, Paul believed that in Christ, Onesimus could be trusted to work harder than anyone else and to refrain from ever again taking that which did not belong to him. So here's the point. The new birth transforms a man who can't be trusted to someone that is trustworthy and able to be counted on. Now, is that you? That's what what God had done in Onesimus' life. And it seems to me to be in a fairly short amount of time in which God produced this kind of change. Is it possible that there's someone here who has been saved for a long time 
And yet, because you've not allowed the Holy Spirit of God to really work uh, His full and complete work in you, that you'd have to admit, maybe even your boss, your coworkers, maybe even your spouse, maybe your children, maybe your pastor would have to say, you know, yeah, I, I believe he's saved, and I, I think he's a pretty good guy, but I don't know that I trust him. I'm not sure that he can be trusted. Well, that's a problem because a, someone who's been begotten by God, they used to be unprofitable. They shouldn't be unprofitable anymore. There ought to be some profit there. There ought to be some profitability. So he says, he says in the area of trustworthiness, he is now profitable. But how about in the area of loyalty? In the area of loyalty. Second element in which, again, we think about what Onesimus had done. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 5 and verse number 37, but let your communication be yea, yea, Nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You know what Jesus is saying there? He's just, he's just saying this. Listen, just, just say what you mean and mean what you say. And fulfill your word. If you say you're going to do something, you better do it. If the answer to something is yes, then say yes. If the answer to something is no, then say no. But let your yea be yea and let your nay be nay. Anything else than that, anything apart from that is evil. Now, previously... Again, uh, Onesimus was someone that could not be counted on to be loyal. Are you with me, Onesimus? Oh, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm just, you know, waiting for my, waiting for my turn. And when it comes, I'm out of here. You know, say all the right things. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm your servant. I'm your slave. I'm happy working for you. I'm doing the best that I can. But really, really, there was a wandering eye. The Bible says in Titus chapter 3, in verse number 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Listen, this is what, this is what the believer needs to be. Again, we're to, uh, we're, we're to be subject to our authority. Uh, prior to being saved, Onesimus was not subject to his authority. Even though he was under the control, under the authority of his master Philemon, uh, he, 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 uh, he was looking for any way to get out from underneath that shadow of that authority. But now, now as a believer, he is willingly saying, hey, listen, I, I gladly place myself under your control once again. I will be loyal to you. I will never leave you. I will never run away from you like I once did. Philemon no doubt wrestled with the thought or the idea that if I take him back, will he, will he do what he did before? Will he abandon me again? Will he leave me hanging? Or will he leave me in the middle of a job, in the middle of a project? And Paul writes and he indicates uh, that the new birth that Onesimus had experienced would keep him from ever running away again. The unprofitable decisions Onesimus had made in the past were no longer to be feared. Because in Christ, the unprofitable is made profitable. Can I say, number two, Allow me to say this, the new birth enables us, according to verse number 12, the new birth enables us to do hard things. The new birth enables us to do hard things. In our text, there are three men who, uh, who have experienced the new birth. The one is the author. The other is the addressee who he's writing the letter to. And then the other person is sort of the subject of the letter. It's an Onesimus. And, and, and really, the truth of the matter is, in every instance, in every case, each of these individuals is being asked to do something hard. But I want to focus specifically on what is being asked of Philemon as well as what is being asked of Onesimus. Number one, we find that Onesimus is being asked to repent. He's being asked to repent. Now look at what he says in verse number 12. Whom I have sent again. How do you suppose that conversation went? Onesimus is just rejoicing. I'm, I'm a believer. I've got peace. This is wonderful. My heart is filled with joy. Paul, is there anything I can do for you? And we're going to see here in just a moment that he was serving Paul and he was serving him faithfully. But at a certain point, I don't know exactly when, but as Paul begins to dive deeper into Onesimus' story and he realizes what he has done and who he's tied to and connected to, and he begins to connect the dots, is, is, is Onesimus is just so eager to serve Paul and do whatever Paul wants him to do. Paul sits him down and says, I need to have a conversation with you. 
And Onesimus, I'm sure, is, tell me anything. I, I want to grow. I want to learn. This is wonderful. Man, you're pouring into me. I can't thank you enough. Well, what I'm getting ready to ask you to do is, is maybe not going to be something that is going to be real fun. Oh, try me, try me. I, I promise. I'm up to the task. You know, I mean, you know how it is. Sometimes new believers are just so filled with zeal and, and, uh, and joy and excitement. And then Paul drops the bomb. I want you to go back home. I want you to go back to Colossae. And I want you to stand before your master again. And I want you to apologize for what you've done. I want you to repent. And I want you to seek restoration. Um, I... My mind, in my mind's eyes, I think about this story, I can see the smile of Onesimus' face slowly fading away. And maybe the color begins to drain. You want me to do what? You, you, you want me to leave here? Leave you? Serving you? And, and, you're, and you're teaching me? You're pouring into me? And you want me to go back there? What, what if he turns me in because of the law that I broke? What if he takes my life? What if, I mean, legally he could do that as a runaway slave. What if, what if things don't go so well in this encounter? And yet Paul continues to press him. This is what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to get right with the person that you have wronged, the person that you have offended. It is the right thing to do. I have to think that Onesimus' flesh resisted this encounter, resisted standing in front of Philemon. And yet he had been taught by the Apostle Paul. He had been taught by the Holy Spirit that this was the right thing for him to do. In his presence, standing before Philemon, his presence indicated that he knew what he had done in the past was wrong and that he was sorry for what he had done. And if, if Philemon would be willing to give him the opportunity, he would do everything in his power to make it right. And you know as well as I do that repentance is a very hard thing for most people. You've seen, you've seen no doubt the shows or the dramatization in which, you know, somebody's got to apologize to another and they st stammer and stutter over the word sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm they just can't get out. Just, it's meant to be humorous. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that long before that ever gets to our lips, that conflict is waged in our hearts. As we think of who it is that we've offended and you need to go to that person, you need to apologize to them. And the flesh of man says, no chance, not on your life. Am I going to go stand before that person and humble myself and admit, admit that what I did was wrong and the way that I responded was wrong and the way that I interacted with that person was wrong? Never, never will I do that. Repentance is hard. Repentance, listen, is not merely admitting wrongdoing. Repentance is not just simply tears and promises never to do something again. Uh, certainly, if you've been around any length of time, you've dealt with a scenario in which someone gets caught. And because they've been caught, now it's, I've got to figure out a way out of this thing. And so if I can act and, 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 and act out, you know, how sorry. But that's, that's not true repentance. Repentance is not just putting on a show. Repentance is a sincere attitude of the heart that admits what one has done, that expresses remorse and pledges to restore and then follows through. One, listen, one cannot be saved until they are willing to repent. That means to turn away from their sinful habits. So how do you know that repentance is real when someone turns away from what they've done that's wrong? When someone walks away from those old habits, that's what repentance is. It's a, it's a change of heart. It's a change of mind. When they display evidence of turning away from that sinful habit or practice, you can be fairly certain that their repentance is sincere. And the simple fact that Onesimus is standing there before Philemon, and, 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 and he is uh, looking him in the eye, and he is admitting what he has done is wrong, and he is saying, if you'll take me back, I'll work harder than any other slave that you have, is indicative of the fact that Onesimus has a heart that has been transformed by God towards repentance. So that's the hard thing that Onesimus is being asked to do. But what's the hard thing that Philemon is being asked to do? Well, it's this. It's forgive. See it in verse 12? Whom I have sent again. You know, that's, that's his hard thing. What's your hard thing, Philemon? Well, here it is. Thou therefore receive him. That is mine own bowels. Now, Paul writes, and he asks... He asked Philemon to refresh his bowels just as Philemon had been known to do for many others. Did you see that in verse number 7? We talked about that. The, 
First time that we looked at this text, for we have great joy and consolation, I love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. And so you know what he's saying here in verse number 12? He's saying, just as you've been faithful to refresh the bowels of others, the heart of others, the innermost being of others, uh, finally, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing for me. Would you refresh my bowels as well? How can you do that? By forgiving and restoring. But Paul says, I want to be refreshed too. You know, the way to refresh Paul was never going to be easy. Ever. I'm thinking to myself that we have, this in, uh, we have this instance here in the book of Philemon in which he's saying, listen, here's the way that you can encourage me. Here's the way that you can refresh me. But did you know that, that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi? And he told them this. He said, here's how you can fulfill my joy in chapter 2. Here's how you do it. Here's how you make me happy. That you be like-minded. Having the same mind and same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Do you sort of get the idea that pleasing the Apostle Paul wasn't easy? Here's why. Because the things that please the Apostle Paul are the things that please the Holy Spirit. Because the Apostle Paul was in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. The truth of the matter is, really, this isn't Apostle Paul asking Philemon to do this. This isn't the Apostle Paul asking the church of Philippi to do this. This is the Holy Spirit of God asking them to do these things. Can I just tell you that God, God never hesitates. God never pulls back from asking us to do hard things. Do you remember what God asked Abraham to do? We talked about it just a few weeks ago. Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Take him up to the mountain and offer him there as a sacrifice. Think that was easy? You think that was something that Abraham delighted in, that Abraham couldn't wait to do? That was something he was waiting to check off his bucket list? Not on your life. It was the last thing that Abraham wanted to do. But because God asked him to do it, he was willing. He was willing to do it. What is God asking you to do? What hard thing has God spoken to you about? Maybe as a family or maybe as a couple or maybe it's just a single individual. God has said, I want you to take this step that you have not yet taken that step. What is, what is God asking of Onesimus? Repent. What is God asking of Philemon? Forgive. Now, now here's, the, here's the thought. When Christ taught his disciples to forgive and he told, taught them to give, forgive repeatedly, they cried out with this cry, Lord, increase our faith. We read of that in Luke chapter 17 and verse number 5. Now, why is that? Why would that be their natural response? Well, here's why. Because forgiving and restoring is hard. And can I say this? It requires faith. It requires faith. Only those who have experienced, only those who have been begotten, those who have experienced the new birth can faithfully participate and accomplish this practice. And here's, here's how we do it. We do it only as we keep our eyes on our Savior who models this type of forgiveness for us. Do you remember what, do you remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.32? And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Why should you do this? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. In other words, if we'll get our eyes on God and take our eyes off ourselves or the offenses of others, keep our eyes on the Lord, and we look at Him and watch as, we, as He repeatedly forgives us over and over and over again. You know what that only enables us to do? That only enables us to do the hard thing of forgiving and restoring. Colossians 3, 12 and 13, the Bible says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Do you see that? That's the same, the same theme repeated again. Why should you forgive? Well, did Christ forgive you? Well, Christ forgave you, then why aren't you willing to forgive others? So we see the new birth enables us to do hard things, but notice thirdly and finally, the new birth converts takers into ministers. The new birth, the new birth takes someone who had previously been a taker. Give me, give me, give me, give me. More, more, I'll even take that which doesn't belong to me. The new birth takes that person and transforms them, converts them into a minister. Look what Paul says about Philemon, or excuse me, about Onesimus in verse number 13. He says, Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Paul, when he met Onesimus, he was a lost, runaway slave. 
He was funding his life on what he had taken from someone else. However, when he writes this letter, he is now a born-again believer who Paul views as a capable minister or servant to him in his bonds. Paul hated, hated the thought of sending him back. In fact, Paul even said, you know, I thought, I, I actually thought about just keeping him and allowing him to minister to me in your place because I know you would, you would want me to have a minister. But as he says in the next verse, he says, but I couldn't do that without you knowing it. I want you to receive that blessing. I want you to receive it uh, as, as something that you have chosen, not just because I've chosen that for you. And so here's Paul. He's, he's wrestling with this, this idea. Uh, he wants to retain Onesimus, but he would never think of doing so without Philemon's knowledge and blessing. And can I just t- t- to remind you that the Christian life is a life of ministry and service. True believers are not looking to take But instead, they're looking to give, to minister, to serve. The Bible says about Jesus in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I find that there were a couple of instances of ministering in this passage. Number one, I discovered that Paul ministered to Onesimus by sharing the gospel with him. So Paul was a minister. Paul was not a taker. Paul was a giver. Paul was not looking just for people to fill his hand up with, uh, with things that, that they could give. No, no, Paul was ministering. How did he minister to Onesimus? By sharing the gospel with him. I, I thought to myself, you know, it had been easier probably for Paul if he would have never shared the gospel with Onesimus. I mean, you think about, you think about what he's dealing with here, and he sure sort of had a mess to clean up, didn't he? Have you ever, have you ever, uh, have you ever kind of counted the cost? And I, I probably should get involved with this guy's life, but look at all the baggage. Look at, the, look at the mess that he is. Look at, look at what we're going to have to deal with here. He's got, he's got two messed up marriages. He's got kids from both women. He's got, you know, he, he's got uh, financial problems. He's got, uh, he's got maybe some mental health issues. Maybe he's got some substance abuse issues. Be easier, it'd be easier for me just to walk away. Sometimes we, sometimes we think that in our flesh, don't we? It'd be easier just to walk away. Sometimes it's easier to avoid dealing with all the baggage that can come along with someone new to the faith. Nowadays, the average couple that comes into our church, they're living together. They're not married. Many of them perhaps have drugs in their background, if not currently using. They've got alcohol abuse in their background. Perhaps there's financial issues that need to be worked through. Maybe there's destroyed relationships. Just a host of things that that, that need to be dealt with. And a lot of times we, we count the cost and we say, you know, I don't know that I have the time for this. I don't know that I have the mental ability to, to stick through all of this and really get this person, this individual, the help that they need. Paul, Paul didn't, Paul didn't look at that, did he? You know, Paul led Onesimus right to Christ. Taught him the way of a follower of Christ. He leads him to return to Philemon. He writes this letter. I mean, Paul goes the extra mile in order in order to see this thing through. And in doing so, we see his ministering heart all over this encounter. Paul, the great apostle, refused refused to see himself as a a, a taker. He says, I'm just a minister. Notice notice Onesimus served Paul in his bonds. I'm thinking to myself that Paul is a prisoner. So Onesimus probably was running errands for him. Maybe he was securing food for him. We're studying the book of 1 Corinthians and, and Paul in some of his writings, actually in the book of Philippians, uh, Paul writes that they had ministered to him in his bonds, the church of Philippi. They had done so by sending an offering, sending a gift. We're given to understand that prisoners in Rome, uh, Rome was under no obligation to feed and uh, the only, only obligation they, they were under was to provide a, 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 a roof over their heads, basically. And so if a prisoner was going to have anything by way of food or drink or a pillow or a blanket or fresh clothes or anything along those lines. Someone else was going to have to provide that for him. And I just have to think, I just have to think that Onesimus probably was ministering to Paul in these ways. Maybe he helped him with letters and correspondence. Maybe he washed his clothes. Maybe he just sat and listened to him talk. Every once in a while, sometimes we just need that, don't we? Someone just listen to us talk. We don't know all that Onesimus did, but we can see from what Paul writes here, that Onesimus had, had previously been a taker. But now, now the new birth had transformed him. And now he's a minister. He's a servant. 
This is what the new birth does in a life. As we conclude tonight, can you see evidence in your life of the new birth? Can you look at areas that once you were unprofitable and now today you see some level of profitability? You you see some worth and some value there? In Onesimus, it was trustworthiness, it was loyalty. Are you routinely doing spiritually hard things for the honor and glory of the Lord? Are you willing to repent when you're wrong? And when someone wrongs you and they come and they sincerely repent, are you willing to forgive them and to restore them? Those are hard things to do, but the new birth, those who have been been begotten by God are capable of doing those things. Are you a taker with a consistent proverbial hand out at all times, or are you a giver, a minister, and a servant? What difference, what difference has the new birth made in your life?